are listening to The Addiction Files, where we discuss evidence-based treatment, clinical pearls and resources, while striving to destigmatize the treatment of addiction in our medical culture and save lives. We are the addiction doctors, Dr. Darlene Peterson and Paula Cook. Welcome to this episode of The Addiction Files. We are excited to be back tonight. We are talking about drug updates. What is new in the world of addiction medicine? We have a couple new things kind of out there on the horizon. We're talking about the approval of the new medication from Brayburn Brixotti that just was announced. And then we have a couple of novel approaches to alcohol use disorder treatments. So there's a couple studies that we're talking about the use of GLP-1 and reduced drinking days. What is that all about? So we're going to talk about that. And there was a press release on spironolactone for alcohol use disorders and naltrexone PRN for binge drinking. So let's talk about those things, Paula. What Tell us about this Brixotti. What is that? Well, this medication has been a long time coming. I think it's, I don't even know the number of years. I think they've been trying to get it approved through the FDA, but it was just approved, I think in the month of May uh, by the US FDA. It's a extended release injectable buprenorphine product. So we already have, there is already one injectable extended release buprenorphine product on the market that we are able to use, which comes in two different doses, 300 and 100 milligrams. That product's made by Indivior, still under patent. And so this brings another product to the market. The difference between this medication and the other medication that's available is this is available in two different formulations, a weekly and a monthly injection. Also, this medication has different doses, like I think a wider variety of doses than the one that we currently have. Um, There are other, there's some other subtle differences about the time to initiate the medication. Um, And so I think, you know, this brings some interesting things to light, whether or not a weekly medication is going to be helpful, that that's debatable. I don't know. I mean, this is just our opinion and from our clinical experience, but this medication is an important newcomer to the party because we really don't have very many, 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 oh my goodness, very many medications to treat opioid use disorder. And it's a huge problem. So when something is released like this, we want to give it some attention. So tell me a little bit about um, what you've learned, Darlene, in terms of the study you read, in terms of efficacy. The study was just a non-inferiority study comparing it to transmucosal buprenorphine. So we don't have any like head-to-head com- studies comparing it to what's currently on the market, as we know as the in- injectable buprenorphine or sublocade that we are all familiar with. And But that is just what we currently have is just the once a month injection. And now there is that flexibility where we have monthly or the weekly, like you said, Paula. And this is where we probably have had the most discussion is when, when would this be useful? A couple of things is initiation. What our current injectables are is you have to have technically somebody needs to be stable for one week on oral buprenorphine before you initiate injectable buprenorphine with the labeling on the Brixotti, what it's currently saying is they can have one dose of oral buprenorphine. So transmucosal when I say oral, and then they can be initiated on injectable. And this has more injection sites available. So it's also can be injected in the buttocks, can be injected in the abdomen, or actually can be in the upper arm. For those patients where we struggle um, getting them convinced to do the injection or they have had negative or poor experience with previous injections, having more injection sites available, that could be a positive as well. It does say on there, if you have somebody who is relatively buprenorphine naive, then the like 
upper arm injection site is not recommended. I didn't go honestly into much research of what they found in the studies of why. This would be challenging. I know in private practice setting, there's no information on cost of this. These medications have been quite cost prohibitive. Rapid initiation is what you're thinking. Is this? That's what it'd be useful for. It would be hard it, because it's sometimes hard enough to get something approved and shipped to your office and to only have it for a week would be just in my in my mind I'm like not incredibly helpful when you are in a group practice self-employed essentially like in my setting you can't really float these like buy and bill type of medications and hope that you're going to get paid by the insurer so that's a big negative now I see this in the emergency room setting or the hospital setting could be helpful where you need to do rapid initiation of patients and you need to engage them until you can get them into stable care. So that's where I see this weekly dosing, especially where you have patients who are very injectable hesitant and maybe won't commit to a month. I do have patients like that. And maybe if we could just say, hey, try a week and see how you do. Injectables, we've always been a huge, a huge fan of. Right. And the fact that there are different doses is actually really great. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what the different doses manifest as for patients, because injectables are different, obviously, to sublingual. But I think that's going to be really nice to... Right now, the, you know, Sublocate is really great. It's wonderful, especially for certain populations, but it's one, basically one dose, one initiating dose, 300 milligrams. So I'm yeah. interested to see how this works out. And I agree with you. I think it's going to be really helpful in emergency departments or in low barrier, low threshold clinics. So yes. I worked in a clinic like that previously, and I'm working in one now. And I can think of times I would definitely use this if we had it, if we, yeah. if we had the financial backing to buy it and just have it already in our locked refrigerator for buy and bill, um, I think it would be wonderful because we could just give them one sublingual dose and then initiate or even just initiate. And I know there's been some studies in emergency departments um, where they've just been initiating this as the initial buprenorphine dose for patients, especially those who have been using fentanyl. Yes. So I think it's going to be, you're right, it's got a lot of barriers to it, much like other long-acting injectable medications, Um, but maybe it has some utility, especially the weekly dosing and, you know, having just that shorter term dosing, like you said, and then having different milligrams to, to inject people with. Well, I think it's just understanding this, this landscape where you have so much, your patients vary their use and sometimes be, you've got to be able to get them feeling better. So you've got to have that dosing flexibility. So I agree with you having just even more dosing flexibility and getting them to that steady state is what's helpful. And helpful for people who are otherwise not very stable. Like I've people who are experiencing homelessness, where getting them a prescription of sublingual buprenorphine is difficult in and of itself. And then them safekeeping it is difficult. Um, or people who are going to be traveling or going to treatment or something like that, where you want to just give them one single dose to get them to where they're going before they transition to a new treatment partner would be helpful. Well, yeah. And I think it's so under-recognized that so many of our patients come from just very chaotic backgrounds, difficult situations that this is why injectable medications can be so helpful and life-changing. And it's so frustrating sometimes when we're trying to get these medications authorized and to the patient of trying to explain to sometimes payers, this can be incredibly stabilizing and we we need to get this to the patient and we need to get that to them now. And so, yeah, having that easy access, that's right. a challenge. 
Yeah. Right. So it's not available yet. It's available for prescribing anticipated in September of this year. So I guess we'll see. We'll see how yeah. it goes. I'm sure but, we'll learn. But we want we need more tools. So yeah. we're happy that there's something new on the market in terms of offering our, our folks who suffer from opioid use disorder. So we have more tools. All right. So a couple different studies that we want to talk about. It, this is such a hot topic right now, mostly for the weight loss effect. But then there's been some several different articles, and there was even a New York Times article that came out talking about the glucagon-like peptide one, the GLP ones, analogs, reducing alcohol drinking. We we're like, okay, what's this all about? Like, what's the mechanism of action, Paula? Like, why why would this be helpful for reducing drinking in our, in our patients? Well, they've been looking at semaglutide on alcohol drinking rats. So based on rat studies, they were have been looking at the effect of semaglutide on GABA neurotransmission. And we know that GABA activity affects alcohol intake. And they found that the acute effects of semaglutide on GABA resulted in basically enhanced GABA release, right? And this is due to increased frequency of, of certain neurons. They looked at neurons in um, the central nucleus of the amygdala and in the infralimbic cortex. So we know that all things kind of fear-based and survival-based and a lot of the addiction pathways emerge out of the amygdala. And, and so watching that and watching the observed behaviors of both alcohol-dependent and non-dependent and then binge drinking rats, they found that GABA release was increased and overall drinking was decreased. And they were suspecting that, that that's the effect. So what did that uh, that study actually end up showing? Well, um, I actually, I can't say what the rat study showed, but they've had some human studies um, with alcohol intake and behavior and medications, um, the GLP-1 agonists. There's actually a really interesting article uh, in the New York Times about, about this topic. It was um, published in February, on February 24th, 2023 by Danny Bloom. And the uh, title of the article is Some People on Ozempic Lose the Desire to Drink and Scientists Are Asking Why. And um, obviously they reference a scientific um, article, but they summarize that the human studies done in Denmark um, show that GLP-1 receptor agonists um, showed that they drink less versus people who receive a placebo. And both groups did decrease alcohol consumption because they're both receiving therapy and being studied. But patients diagnosed with obesity and treated with these medications dramatically reduced the amount they drank compared with those who only received placebo. Um, they also did some things like looked at brain scans of those people who were taking the GLP-1. And they found that not only, so that we talked already about the GABA neurotransmission enhancement, but they found that on brain scan, um, parts of the brain that were involved with cue-induced learning and cue-related um, urges were much less activated with people who were taking the GLP-1 agonist, which that's really fascinating to me and why it was more so in the obese group versus the non-obese group is that just had to do with overall, you know, dampening of the urge to take in calories or was it specific to alcohol? I'm not sure. What do you think about that? No, I think that's really interesting, Paula. And then there was another study similar to that that came out in September of last year called Exenatide Once Weekly for Alcohol Use Disorder Investigated in a Randomized Placebo-Controlled Clinical Trial. And this was Metclossen et al. And this showed a similar thing. Their exploratory analysis revealed that Exenatide did reduce heavy drinking days and total alcohol intake only in their subgroup of patients with BMI greater than 30. But the interesting thing was in their group of patients with the BMI less than 25, those treated with exenatide had an increased number of drinking days by, by almost 27 and a half points 
relative to the placebo group. Now, again, this is a small sample size, but I kind of found that really interesting. Don't you? (laughs) What journal was that? The oh, Journal of Clinical Investigation. Yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting to follow this research. It looks really hot. There's an article published open access online, part of the Lance, Lancet Discovery Science eBiomedicine, actually published yesterday, the 7th of June, 2023, when we we're recording by Aranya and all. And they, again, same kind of study. It's actually more of a rat studies looking at GLP-1 agonists um, on rodents. And they found the same thing, and they looked more at the alcohol-induced reward mechanisms of the nucleus accumbens and found Mm -hmm. that that was reduced. So they indicate, and they found that there was decreased drinking behavior. So it's going to be interesting. I think it's such a hot drug right now in the media, and for a lot of people for weight loss, it's going to be interesting to see if, you know, it becomes a helpful medication for alcohol use disorder, and if it's only for overweight people, or if it's going to be for everybody. But if it really does attenuate uh, GABA and works on elevating dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, which some of these rodent studies show, then it might well be really helpful for all addictions, not only alcohol, right? Because if it's a Mm -hmm. dopamine nucleus accumbens slash ventral tegmental um, medication that it should help with a lot of drugs of a, of um, interest that affect that area, which is pretty much everything. Really interesting. So yeah. very novel, kind of interesting, but very, yeah, very hot topic, but seems to be right now just showing in a very certain subclass of patients, which just goes again, that we're looking as this certain, certain types of kind of addictive disorders who knows like and do we have to have that kind of coupling it's just really fascinating to me but yeah okay so tell us a little bit about spironolactone what what's going on with the buzz there right well i mean again it's more rat buzz um but nida in their nida news has published a you know statement that actually back in September of 2022, that this spironolactone, which is a cardiac medication and and a blood pressure medication, is showing some potential for treatment in alcohol use disorder. So they they were thinking that mineral corticoid receptors, so spironolactone acts as a mineral corticoid antagonist. Yes. Um, Research has been showing that mineralocorticoid receptors, which are throughout the brain and other organs, they regulate fluid and electrolyte balance. That's why we use them for blood pressure and heart failure. They might also play a role in alcohol use and craving, which is kind of interesting. And why? I don't, I don't really understand why I was interested to read this, but the preclinical research and the rodent studies show that the higher receptor sub- signaling of these kinds of receptors in the brain lead to increased alcohol consumption in rats. So when they give these rats spironolactone, which is a mineralocorticoid blocker, the rats drink less alcohol. So these experiments are being run, the NIAAA and and NIDA, especially NIDA researcher um, Leandro Vendrasculo um, has found that increasing doses of spironolactone is decreasing alcohol consumption without causing any other negative affect, excuse me, side effects. And so it's worthy of further investigation. So keep an eye on that. I mean, throughout the years, there have been medications that we have thought might be helpful for alcohol use disorder and small clinical trials and human trials have shown efficacy, but nothing has come forward besides our three FDA approved medications and some of the other AEDs for help with alcohol use disorder, but we are always hopeful, right? We want more tools for alcohol use disorder. And so maybe in the future, spironolactone might be a medication that's helpful. Certainly if we have a patient who could use it otherwise, um, it might be something to consider once we have more evidence to back it up. Well, and I don't know if this is important, but they did note that they did see a decrease with increasing doses in male and female animal models without causing increased side effects, which I think is important because we know of the anti-androgen effects of spironolactone. So it doesn't seem to be that's the reason. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, so, interesting. Yeah, so that just kind of because this mechanism, it just doesn't quite. It just seems very different from our other medications. Yeah, it so. really does. It doesn't. When I heard, when I read, because I often will just look at NIDA news to, just to see what What's is this? coming up and what they're working on. Um, and when I saw the headline, I was like, "What? How is this possible?" So, but it's kind of like Ver- Vereniclin is now being investigated for the use of alcohol use disorder, and why should that be helpful? You know, that's a nicotine, that's a nicotine uh, blocking and agonist drug. So. It's all complicated and we just need to follow the research and stay on top of things and just keep encouraging our patients to keep working on it, keep trying that we're going to keep working with them uh, to find things that work and help them um, in spite of the severity of their of their current condition. And then, okay, our last one, PRN naltrexone. Where did this come about? I, I want to say this came from our patients just doing it and then telling <laughs> us about it because... <laughs> Because they, they do this to us all the time. <laughs> yeah, no, I think this is so interesting. This yeah. article was, it's a great article. It was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry in December 1 of 2022. And the main author is Santos and all. And it's a it's a targeted group of um, uh, participants. It's all sexually, uh, sexual minority men. So either... Uh, men who have sex with men or transgendered men who binge drink and have mild to moderate alcohol use disorder. So it's definitely a subset of people, but this population was targeted because they have a higher incidence of binge drinking. So I think this is why the population was chosen. And uh, what they did is they did a double blinded placebo controlled trial they looked at 120 men who binge drink and have some evidence of mild to moderate alcohol use disorder, randomized in a one-to-one ratio. One group got targeted oral naltrexone, so they got 50 milligrams, which is a typical dose of oral naltrexone, which is an opioid antagonist medication that is FDA approved for alcohol use disorder, before they went out drinking or placebo, and everyone got weekly counseling for 12 weeks. And what they looked at were binge drinking intensity. So in other words, how many drinks did you have in the last 30 days? How many binge um, drinks, how many binge drinking episodes did you have in the last week? Number of binge, excuse me, number of drinks in the last week, and number of drinking days in the last week. And what they found, they actually had a lot of people complete the trial. They had a 93% completion rate, right? That's pretty good. And what they found was naltrexone was associated with a significantly reduced reported number of binge drinking days. So number one, weeks with any binge drinking. There's number two, number of drinks per month and alcohol craving. Um, I think that's really interesting. Those are good outcomes. And uh, the men who took the drug said that they took it on average 2.5 days a week and um, that it was definitely, you know, had a sustained effect over drinks per month, even if they only took it several days a week. So targeted naltrexone might be really helpful. It might be a good tool for people who don't want to take a medication every day, who don't feel like they have enough of a problem to take a medication every day, or for people who just know they're going to go out and drink too much and don't want to. And so they can just take this medication before going out. Interestingly, I heard about this article. So this was also written up in the New York Times, (laughs) my favorite (laughs) news source. It was written in an article published on February 14th, 2023, um, called Binge Drinking May Be Curbed with a Pill in the health section of um, of the newspaper. It was a patient who brought me this article. She has been struggling with binge drinking um, for most of her adult life. She's in her late, actually, she's in her early 30s. And she's really had a lot of negative consequences from binge drinking. She hasn't been a chronic daily drinker. She doesn't have physiological dependence to alcohol. She doesn't have withdrawal when she does not drink. And she doesn't necessarily crave alcohol in between drinking episodes, but she likes to go out to the bar, go to happy hour. And when she does, she gets completely blackout intoxicated. And as a result, she's had several assaults. She's had several, many more than you could 
count high risk sexual encounters. And then other times where she just hasn't known what she's done. And that's pretty scary, right? Yes. She read this article and actually sought out our clinic to try naltrexone. And I will report back that she's doing fabulously on it. She finds that it's really helpful. And she has reduced the number of drinks every time she goes out. And she's reduced the total number of drinking days in the month. On a one-to-one -one clinical report, I can just attest that this patient that I just had, who read this article a few months ago, it's really working for her just to take it as needed. And I've been trying to persuade her just to take it all the time because <laughs> I'm worried about <laughs> her. But, um, but anyway, this is a study that looked at exclusively gay and transgender men, but we can extrapolate. I think we can extrapolate that. And of course, it's great to have a study that looks at our gay and transgender friends, especially during Pride Month. We want to always make sure that population is studied and, and get the right kind of research that's applicable to them. Thank you, Paula. I think that's fantastic. It's so funny that you brought that up because when you sent me this information, I was like, I just had a patient that came in asking for this and I had not read the article yet. Hey, it's summertime and I tend to drink too much when I'm out mowing the lawn and I need something. I also, one thing I strongly recommend is this is a great time and just a plug for the NIAAA is handout. I give them the rethink your drinking like pamphlet at the same time. And I'm like you, Paul, I, I want to always, we always want to do more. But if your patient's coming and they'll do this much, again, it comes back to this meet them where they are. We've got new medication, new injectable coming out with a couple more dose options. So we've got Brixati. So weekly dosing, monthly dosing with a couple more, three different monthly doses, 64, 96, and 128 milligrams. What that will end up translating to, we'll see. And then we've got a couple different novel things on the horizon, potentially, could they be useful for alcohol use disorders? Will remains to be seen, will GLP ones, do they reduce alcohol, alcohol use? Could spironolactone be used in alcohol to reduce alcohol use and cravings? We already know naltrexone has been very effective to reduce alcohol cravings and drinking days, but PRN naltrexone to reduce binge drinking, this may be something to definitely keep in our toolbox and make sure that our patients have access to it and bring it up and use that opportunity to give them information and educate our patients. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. We're at the addiction phi fi and then the number one. So the addiction phi one. We like to tweet all kinds of relevant and uh, breaking news and links to relevant articles. And of course, our latest podcast episode gets um, pasted into Twitter. Um, our podcast is published on many platforms. Please encourage other people you know who might benefit from the podcast to listen in. And you're welcome to give us ratings on iTunes and other platforms. These ratings help our podcast kind of elevate when people are searching for addiction medicine content. And our goal, Darlene and I started this podcast three and a half years ago because we really wanted to target a population who wanted to learn more about good evidence-based approach to addiction medicine. All right. Good night. Thank you, Paula. Until next time. Hey, check us out at theaddictionfiles.com or email us at theaddictionfiles at gmail.com. Thank you so much to Ricky Valides for use of his song, Awake. Check him out at rickyvalides.com. purposes only. Hosts and guests are not responsible for any harm caused by information obtained from the source. As each person is unique, you are advised to seek the advice of your own healthcare professional to treat any medical conditions you may be having. Opinions expressed on the show are those of the addiction files and not of our respective employers.